Good morning, Coastal Christian. I'm Jesse Stokes, the son of Matt Stokes, and a child of God. Amen. I'm excited to be with you this morning. Philippians chapter 4. If you have a Bible, uh, you can open up to there, but also you have the printout with Philippians 4 on it. Are you guys ready? Say yes. yes. Therefore, my beloved brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand fast in the Lord. I entreat you, Yodia and Synthike, to agree in the Lord. I ask you also, true companion, to help these women who have labored by my side in the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of the fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be made known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is, um, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, whatever is worthy of praise, think on these things. And what you have heard and seen and learned and received from me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you also. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that you revived. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly at length that you revived your concern for me. That you revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. I've learned the secret in every circumstance, any circumstance, of facing abundance and need, hunger and food. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yet it was kind for you to share in my trouble. For you Philippians know in the beginning of the gospel, no one entered into partnership with me in giving and, ex and receiving except you only. Even when I left for Thessalonica, you sent me need, help for my needs once and again. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, or sorry, need <laughs> once and once again. I've received full payment and more. I'm well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering and sacrifice acceptable to God. And my God will supply all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To God the Father and Jesus Christ be the glory forever. Amen. 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 Greet the saints in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me send you greetings. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with your spirit. Amen. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4 is where we're going to be. Today we're going to be focusing in on verses 4 through 13. But I want to ask you a question before I begin. How many of you used a binky when you were a baby? Raise your hand if you used a binky. How many of you remember using the binky? If you don't, you can ask your parents. So when I was born, I was the first born, so my parents made a decision. They chose not to give me a binky. That's why I'm so hardcore today. If you were wondering, <laughs> I know a lot of you come up and ask me, Jesse, why are you so hardcore? Well, this is why. My parents never allowed me to use a binky. But my sister Kelly, actually, she actually got addicted to her binky. She used it all the time. It was crazy. I remember it. And she would just like freak out when she didn't have it. And so my parents, they did something devious. They took the binky and I threw it in the trash, and I told Kelly, my sister, that the birds ate the binky. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, the birds ate the binky. <laughs> yep, so you can go to the bird picture next. Is there a bird? Oh, no bird. Okay, I took the bird out. Anyway, the birds ate the binky. Okay, so my sister had a grudge against birds for like the next couple years, because she really thought the birds ate her binky, but finally she figured it out like last year, so that was awesome. <laughs> so, you know, what is another name for a binky, though. Shout it out. I heard a bubble. <laughs> Pacifier. <laughs> Pacifier. That's what it's called, right? And so you can have the most anxious, worried baby freaking out, crying, going crazy, and you put this thing into its mouth. 
And all of a sudden, it becomes like totally peaceful, totally content. All right? You can put the binky, and it'll just, it'll just calm down, right? And it still works for me today. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but you know what? It's called a pacifier for a reason. And I think as babies, they need that. But I think when we grow up, we still need a pacifier. It might not be a binky, but we still need something to calm our soul when we get anxious. We still need there to be something that calms us down and gives us contentment when we feel so overwhelmed. And I'm here to tell you today that the pacifier is Jesus Christ. And so I want to talk about how you can find contentment in Christ. Scripture talks a lot about contentment in the word of God. It says in 1 Timothy 6.6 6, that godliness with contentment is great gain. It says in the word of God in Hebrews 13.5, it says be content with what you have. Philippians 4.11 says I've learned the secret of being content in every circumstance. Psalm 23 verse 1, David says what? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want in other places, the word contentment is translated as satisfied. And in many of the Psalms, David talks about how God satisfies him. It says in Psalm 65, verse 4, it says, We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your love. Are you satisfied today, coastal Christian? Are you content? Because this is something we need to learn because we live in a world that is so discontent. We live in a world that is not at peace. But we can have contentment in every circumstance. J.D. Rockefeller, one of the richest people in the world, was once asked, how much money will make a man happy? You know what he said? Just one more dollar. See, that's our mindset. If I just had a little bit more, then I would finally be happy. But you see, that will never make you more happy. I have this definition that I kind of came up with uh, uh, about contentment, and it's this. Discontentment focuses on what you don't have, but contentment is thankful for what you do have. Discontentment focuses on what you don't have, but contentment is thankful for what you do have. And we have so much, church. We have eternal life. We have forgiveness through Christ. The Bible says that all things are ours through Christ that we have obtained everything we need for life and godliness. The word content, it means to be satisfied, to be happy, to be at peace, to be gratified and fulfilled. The opposite of contentment is discontentment or dissatisfaction, unhappiness, or sadness. Coastal Christian, we need to learn contentment. We need to learn it God's way. Because in every single one of us, there is a God-shaped hole in our hearts that only God can fill. You can try to fill it with other things I did in high school. I tried to fill it with sports. I tried to fill it with athletics and um, relationships and different things. And being popular, it didn't fill me. Only Jesus did. And so when Jesus fills the heart, he gives you that contentment. You see, contentment is not, discontentment is nothing new. That was actually Satan's first thing he did in the Garden of Eden. He came to Eve and he said, did God really say that you can't eat of everything? You see, Satan started off and he said, you know what? There's something that you're missing out on. There's something that you don't have. You don't have this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so Satan was trying to twist God's word and make Eve feel like she was missing something, even though God gave her and Adam everything. See, that's the tactic of the enemy. And you see, we can learn from the Apostle Paul because Paul found contentment in prison. Think about that. Man, I don't know about you, but if there's any situation to complain in, it would be being in prison, especially when you're in prison for serving Jesus. You're not in prison for sin, you're in prison for righteousness. And we look at Paul in the Bible, he went through so many trials, and yet he said, I know how to be content. I want to read for you what Paul went through in 2 Corinthians 11, and it's powerful. It says this, Paul says, I have been 
through far more imprisonments, countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I received from the hand of the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and day I was adrift at sea. I was on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. He, he mentions danger so many times, but Paul's basically saying, I live a life of suffering for Jesus. If you look at my life, I'm constantly in danger, constantly being beaten up. How many of us, raise your hand, if you've ever been beaten up for Christ before, physically attacked? Okay, we haven't been through what Paul's been through. We haven't been to prison for our faith. But yet Paul said, I've learned to be content. I've learned to trust God. You see, that is powerful. And he said, I've learned to be content. Think about that. None of us are born content. You see, going back to the baby analogy, what's the baby's first words? Me, my, no, wah, wah, and mama. <laughs> but the baby's first words are just, wah, you know, they're complaining, they're selfish. They're wanting everything for themselves. And we have to grow out of that where we stop wanting everything for ourselves and we start finding that contentment in Christ. One thing I want to say, too, is contentment does not mean that you're lazy in your faith. And contentment does not mean that you're not pushing forward in life. Because Paul said, I press on towards the prize. I keep on going forward. So Paul said that he's not, you know, he's not content saying where he's at spiritually because he wants to grow more. And so there's an aspect where contentment also means pursuing the Lord and going forward. It's not a laziness because the Bible talks uh, against laziness and being a sluggard. And so I want to talk to you this morning about the three keys to contentment. So you guys have your paper, and I have those three keys on there. And the first key to contentment is praise. Say it with me. Praise. praise. We got to learn to praise God even in the suffering. Paul said, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say it. Rejoice. You see, Paul went through so much suffering in his life. And Paul, Paul went through the hardest circumstance, persecution. And you know, he learned to be content. Even in prison, even when being beaten up for Christ. And so, if Paul could be content in Christ, we can learn that too. And you see, that's the lesson. And so Paul actually was in handcuffs and he was shackled in chains. And Jim, you can come up <laughs> and you can do your thing. But um, Paul was shackled and in chains, even though he was doing everything right. And those chains were binding on him, yet he found a reason to praise the Lord. He found a reason to rejoice. He found a reason to worship God. <laughs> and so Paul was locked up. Thank you, Officer Jim. Don't try anything either. <laughs> you said don't try anything. So Paul was locked up in chains. And I'm sure that Paul in the chains was hurting and in prison. And Troy, you can come up. And in prison, he was praising. You see, there's a story in the book of Acts where Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God even in prison. And so Paul is, you know, in the chains, and he's locked up, and he's bound up, but he knows that he's the freest person in the world because he had Christ. And so Paul was like, Lord, I know I have these chains. I know it's hard. I know, I, I feel like, Lord, sometimes I don't deserve this because I'm following you, but I know that my, I know that my, my chains, chains are gone. I know. I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And I know, Lord, that even in the suffering, there is power. I know that you have power because there, there is, is power. power. In the name of Jesus, to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. And God, 
I know you've saved me. And Lord, I'm just going to trust you in the midst of these chains. And God, so I'm going to, I will, I'll so break. I'm going to break off these chains and wipe away stains and be all that I want to be because I am redeemed. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Troy. And so as Paul was praising, as Paul was praising, the chains were released. As Paul was worshiping, the chains fell off. Not necessarily the physical chains, because when he praised God, even in Philippi, he stayed in prison. In, in Acts, he actually, the, the earthquake happened, he got released from prison. But sometimes in life, you praise God and the chains don't fall off. You stay in the circumstance. Sometimes you praise God in the storm and the storm stays there. But sometimes the chain of your depression, the chain of your fear and anxiety, the chain of your overwhelming thoughts that are negative, they break because you're praising God in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil for you are with me your rod and staff comfort me and so sometimes God leads you in the valley and tells you to praise him in the valley because he's with you in the valley amen? amen hallelujah but sometimes praise can actually change your circumstance and sometimes praise can actually change the situation sometimes trust God can actually deliver you from the trial we looked at Daniel yesterday at Sight and Sound, and we saw that Daniel, or sorry, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into that fire, and they trusted God, and they praised the Lord, and King Nebuchadnezzar said, you need to bow down, and they said, we will not bow down. They said, our God is able to deliver us from this fiery furnace, but even if he doesn't, we will not bow down and worship your false gods. We will worship and praise Yahweh, and you see, God delivered them from that fire. He was with them in the fire. But sometimes he delivers you and changes it. You see, there's a song that goes like this. Sometimes he calms the storm, but other times he calms his child. That's what praise can do. It'll either calm the storm or calm you. But Paul said the secret to contentment, one of the secrets to contentment is learning to praise. Praise is not natural. We naturally complain, but sometimes we've got to put on, the Bible says, a spirit, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of heaviness. Amen. The second thing we need to do to learn contentment like Paul is we need to learn to pray. In Philippians 4, verse 6, it says, do not be anxious about what? But in, with prayer and petition with, let your request be made known to God and the peace of God which passes all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Paul said that when he prays about things, he experiences shalom, peace. You see, the word prayer in Greek, it says with everything with prayer and petition, the word petition means to plead, to beg, to beseech. And so I think a lot of us are like, yeah, well, I prayed about it, but I don't have peace yet. Let me ask you this, have you pleaded and begged and beseeched God? Because if you do that, that will give you peace. God says if you present your request, your anxiety, God will give you peace. You see, sometimes we think that God's just going to give us peace if we, as dad says, chuck one up to the man upstairs. But we have to sometimes plead that over and over again. And then, after pushing through in prayer, God will give you the peace that you need. You see, so God calls us to be content, but it kind of creates a thought like, if I'm content, then why should I pray for things to change, right? Because I should just accept everything. So this is important to understand that being content doesn't mean that you don't pray for things to change. You see, you can be content and still long for the situation to change because God has told us to pray. A content heart still cries out for circumstances to change for deliverance, for people to be saved, for things that burden him. But contentment at the end of the day says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. The content heart submits to God's dealings. You see, contentment is not the opposite of lamenting either. Sometimes we think that if we are lamenting or complaining before the Lord, we're not content, but actually 
being honest with God is the sign that you trust him. If you look at the people in the Bible that had, we call, have the greatest faith, they were the people that sometimes had the most shocking prayers that, you know, think about if we had our prayer meeting at church and Jeremiah came in and sat down and he was in our prayer meeting and he sits down next to us and someone prays, Father, thank you for this day and uh, bless our church meeting and God, I just pray for my family member to be saved in Jesus' name. And then Jeremiah's up in the prayer time. He says, oh, Lord, you have deceived me. I wish I was dead. We'd be like, yo, what, what, get this guy out of here. And so we could see that prayer and be like, yo, he's like cocoa for cocoa puffs <laughs> or something. But you know what? The prayers in the Bible, a lot of them are messy. They're raw. They're real. And so contentment with God comes from being real and honest with God, even if it means Lord, where are you? Even if it means, my God, why have you forsaken me? Even if it means, why are you downcast, O oh, my soul? You see, being honest with God is really the key to contentment. Did you know that 65 of the Psalms, which is the biggest section of all the Psalms, are actually laments? The word lament is a cry of sorrow or grief. The most of the Psalms have lamenting in them. So church, coastal Christian, it is okay to be honest with God. In fact, he wants you to be. So contentment doesn't mean putting a fake smile on and saying, praise the Lord. No, it means being honest with God. And even when it's hard, I've learned to do that. It's still hard sometimes to be honest, but it helps us. Another thing, I just want to mention this subtly. Another thing that goes along with prayer that can really help you find contentment is actually fasting. Because fasting is a way that we can really draw close to God. It's not spoken about a lot in our modern culture because it's really hard to do. But the Bible says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Satisfied is the word content. They shall be filled. And when we fast and we abstain from food and put God higher than food, maybe it's skipping a meal, maybe it's skipping a couple meals, maybe it's going for a day. Guys, I'm telling you from experience and from the word of God that it creates in you a longing for God and a contentment that can really come when you humble yourself in that way. It's not to earn something from God, but it's to put your flesh to death so that your spirit can be closer to God. Because contentment comes from detaching ourselves from the things of this world and realizing that we're strangers and pilgrims on this earth. So I challenge you, Coastal Christian, if you've never fasted before, to try skipping a meal and praying and spending that time with God. It's not dieting. It's actually replacing the time you would spend with food and with God, and that will give you a lot of close, closeness in your relationship with God and contentment. The third thing we need to talk about, if we want to talk about being content, and what Paul did in prison is number one is what? He praised, number two, he prayed, and number three, he changed his perspective. This one's all about your perspective. So if you could put up that picture of the lady. Um, yes, yeah, so this lady, you've probably seen her before. She's pretty famous. Everyone say, hi, lady. Okay, so you can look at this lady, and you can see two different perspectives, two different ways that this lady is. So some people, how many of you guys see a young woman in the picture? Raise your hand. How many of you see an older woman? Okay, about half and half. How many of you can see both? How many of you can't see both yet? Honest. Keep looking. If you look at the nose, that's the young woman looking out. Um, and that's her hair. That white thing is her hair, okay? But you can look in a different way and see it as a, you know, an older lady. So the same picture can be viewed two different ways based on your perspective. Some of us naturally see one thing and some of us naturally see another thing. You see, the same two people can go through the same circumstance and one can come out content and praising God and the other person can come out complaining and feeling like this is the worst thing ever. Why is that? It's all about your perspective. And God teaches us how to have his perspective in his word. He says this. He says in his word, he says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, anything worthy of praise, think upon these things. You know, it would be funny if we actually took a, a postcard and put that on your TV and filtered everything you watch through your TV through that verse, if it's lovely and true and acceptable. 
You probably can't watch CNN for more than five minutes with that card on your TV. Because <laughs> you probably couldn't watch a lot of things on TV that we watch if we put that card, or if we put that on our social media account. Whatever is true, whatever is lovely, if you put that little postcard on, you probably have to unfollow a lot of accounts on social media. But the problem with the reason, the reason that a lot of us aren't content is because of the thoughts that we're thinking. We have some stinking thinking. <laughs> And we got to get rid of that. So I have a little analogy. Uh oh. So I got a cup of dirt here and an empty cup. And so this cup of dirt represents your negative thoughts. Every single one of us has different negative thoughts. Maybe it's an anxiety, maybe it's a fear, maybe it's just a dark thought, a thought that we don't want to have. And right, that thought enters into our clear mind, and we get filled up with junk, and it fills up all the way. And see, we can try to control our thoughts on our own and say, you know what, I'm going to take out a little bit of the anxiety. I'm going to stop being anxious. Okay, you know what, I'm going to take out a little bit of the depression. I'm going to take a little bit out of the anger. I'm going to take a little bit out of the unforgiveness. And you might get a little bit out, but eventually, if you just do it in your own strength, it's probably going to come back and you're going to be full of negative thoughts again. And so just trying to think better on your own, it's not really going to work. How many of you have ever tried to just control your own thoughts? It really is very hard to do. It almost doesn't work. But God gives us the secret. He says, I want you to think about what's pure and lovely and acceptable. And all the things mentioned in there, they're found in the word of God. The word of God is the fulfillment of that passage. Everything in the word of God is pure and lovely and acceptable and perfect and true and just. And so we take the water of the word of God and we fill up our minds with the word of God. What happens to the junk, if we just put in a little bit of the word of God, it's just a little muddy, it doesn't do much. If we put in a little more of the word of God, it might help a little bit, but it's still pretty gross. But if we fill our minds with the word of God, what's gonna happen is all that junk is gonna come out. Still going. We're going to have clear thoughts. <laughs> All right. It's mostly clear. I made a little bit of a mess. I'm going to keep it there because I'm probably going to spill it. But you get the point. <laughs> All right. Father, don't let me spill that. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So you get the point. It works pretty good. But the point is, when we fill our mind with the water, the Bible says that the word of God is like living water, that Jesus is living water. When we fill ourselves with water, right, we're clear. We're mostly clear. <laughs> but really, Jesus makes you fully clear. But when we fill our minds with the word of God, it actually automatically will start to drive out a lot of the demonic thoughts, a lot of the evil thoughts that we face in our mind. And so I challenge you, Coastal Christian, to fill your mind with the word of God. Some of you guys, I mean, I don't know if you noticed, but that passage in Philippians, I did that from my memory. I actually just finished memorizing the entire book of Philippians, uh, all four chapters. And I was going to do the whole thing, but it was going to take too long. <laughs> but I don't do that to boast, or I don't want you guys to look at me and be like, oh, wow, yeah, he did that, cool. I want you guys to see that I'm just a human like you. That actually took me a long time to do. I had to put a lot of work into that. But if you want to memorize the word, you can do it if you put the time in. And I challenge you to memorize the word of God, to focus on it, to dwell on it. Guys, I've had one of the most peaceful weeks this week, even in different sufferings I had, because I was memorizing that book of the Bible. You don't have to start with the book of the Bible. I've been doing it for a while, so I've gotten better. But man, memorize a verse, a verse a day. Man, hide God's word in your heart. Like David said, I've hidden thy word in my heart, your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. This is how we find contentment, is through hiding God's truth in our hearts. Okay, we need to think right thoughts. The last thing is the bonus one, and this is what Paul says, what taught him contentment. He said it's the promise of Philippians 4.13. Does anyone know Philippians 4.13? I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Look at your neighbor and tell them, you can do it through Christ. You can do it 
through Christ. You can do it through Christ. Guys, the word of God says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, let me tell you this. We have twisted that verse and made it applicable to our own self-help goals in 2024. So we go to 2024, and we, we take this verse, and we just, like, apply it to everything. So we see the boxer on TV and be like, yo, man, I just pummeled that guy, yo, for God's glory. It was awesome. You should have seen his face before and after I punched him. Yeah, I won that match. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. <laughs> or you see that high schooler be like, yo, my guy. You know, maybe he's at, like at youth group or something. This never happened at youth group, by the way. Don't worry. He's at youth group. He sees a girl. And he's like, yo, bro, I'm going to ask her out because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. I'm going to get her number. That never happened. Don't worry. Your kids are safe. Or, you know, you see someone uh, bench pressing. You're like, yo, I can hit this max bench press, 315, through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. No, that's not what the verse is meant for. Okay, maybe it could apply to that if really God's leading you, but a lot of times it's not. You see, we go to 2024, and we use that verse for everything, but if you go back to 70 AD, Paul was saying, I know how to be content with no food and with a full stomach in prison. I know how to endure through beatings and whippings and lashings and imprisonment through Christ who strengthens me. I know how to hope in God when all the hope that I have seems lost because of Christ who strengthens me. You see, the word of God in Philippians 4.13, it really means that God can give you contentment and strength to be content no matter what you're going through because Christ strengthens you. Coastal Christian, some of you are going through serious sickness and you're gonna get through that cancer because Christ is strengthening you to trust him in the midst of the valley and you're gonna get through and you're gonna trust him through your kids that have left Christ. Your kids have gone prodigal because Christ strengthens you. You're gonna trust Christ even though you're facing persecution in the workplace because Christ strengthens you. You're gonna endure, you're gonna be bold for Christ even though you're a fearful person because Christ strengthens you. It's not just you, my friend. It is not just you. There is a greater power living in you and his name is Holy Spirit. Romans 8 says, if the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you, you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. Hallelujah. You got double power. It's not just you. You got someone inside of you working in you, working through you. Jesus said, it's greater that I go away because I'll send you the comforter. And when he comes, man, it's going to be a great time. It's to your advantage that I go away because the Holy Spirit now lives in you. You see, with Christ, we can do everything, but without him, we can do nothing. John 15, 5, Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Abide in me. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You see, we need to cling to Christ. I've heard a lot of people say, God will never give you more than you can handle. How many of you have heard someone say that before? I do not agree with that statement one bit. God will give you, how many of you have been given more than you can handle? You feel like you've been. See, God will give you more than you can handle, but he won't give you more than you can handle through Christ who strengthens you through the power of his help. He'll give you more than you can handle in your own strength. I want to read this quote from Jeremiah Burroughs. It's a book um, called The Hidden Jewel of Christian Contentment. It says this, indeed, our afflictions may be heavy, and we may cry out, oh, we cannot bear them. We cannot bear such an affliction, though you cannot tell how to bear it with your own strength. Yet how can you tell what you will do with the strength of Jesus Christ? Sorry. You say you cannot bear it, so you think that Christ could not bear it. But if Christ could bear it, why may you not come to bear it? You will say, can I have the strength of Christ? Yes, it is made over to you by faith. The scripture says that the Lord is our strength, God himself is our strength, and Christ is our strength. There are many scriptures to that effect, that Christ's strength is your strength, made over to you, so that you may be able to bear whatever lies upon you, and therefore find such strange expression in the epistle of St. Paul to the Colossians, praying to the saints, that they may be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering, with joyfulness strengthened with all might according to the power of God, 
his glorious power. Amen. That was a lot there. But what he's simply saying is God gives you strength to endure with patience and long suffering everything that you go through. Jesus said, With man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. You see, with him you can do it, and we can be content. There's this quote that I have really loved recently as I've been meditating on contentment, and it's this. If I don't have it, I don't need it. Say that with me. If I don't have it, I don't need it. If I don't have the promotion, I don't need the promotion. If I don't have the the job, I don't need the job. If I don't have this, I don't need this. Because if God needed to give it to you, he would have. Amen. Amen. You see, Paul learned contentment in the school of suffering. He learned it through trials. He learned it through praise, through prayer, through his changed perspective, and through focusing on the promise. But he learned it through suffering. God taught me a lot of contentment. I'm not there yet. I haven't learned contentment. That's why it's like I'm preaching on this, but I still got a lot to do. But, you know, a couple years ago, I was in a car accident, and I hurt my lower back, and I was in a lot of pain. Uh, to the point where I was depressed at times, for sure, and uh, feeling like I couldn't even get out of bed, feeling I had to leave school early. That's a couple times at college because the pain was so strong, and going to countless physical therapy, doctor, chiropractor, you know, doctors up in Pennsylvania and everything, and the pain wasn't getting better for a while. But I look back on that, and all that suffering, I prayed honest prayers to God, I cried out to him, and I look back on that, and thank God my back's, healed now and a lot better, you know, a lot better, but I look back and I thank God, I thank God for that suffering, because it was in that fire, re-furnace, that I got to know that Jesus is with me. Think about this, if a shepherd has sheep, and a lot of healthy sheep, and there's a sick sheep, where's the shepherd going to focus his attention, on the healthy sheep or the sick sheep? The weak sheep, the sick sheep. When you're weak, when you're sick, when you're hurting, when you're in the trial, you get more attention from the shepherd. That's why Paul says, I'm content with weaknesses, with persecution, with hardships. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Christ is with me when I'm weak. I get more attention from the shepherd. So I'm going to close with a story. I'm going to invite Troy back up and just share this story, this inspiring story of contentment. And we'll come to a close. Many of you know the hymn, It is well with my soul. Raise your hand if you know the hymn. The story of that hymn is powerful. There was a man named Horatio Stafford. He was a businessman. He lost a fortune in 1871. And right after he lost the fortune in the Chicago fire, his four-year-old son died. And so he went through that trial. So he thought, you know what? Our family needs a vacation just to get away and be with God. But he had to finish some business work, so he sent his wife and four children on a boat to England to go on vacation to get their mind off of everything. As they were on their way to England, the boat crashed, and you can put up that picture. The boat crashed, and four, all four kids died. The wife was saved, spared. She got to England, and she sent a telegram to Horatio and said, all kids are gone. What shall I do? And Horatio said, you know, he immediately responded and put everything aside and went to England to go see his wife. And he's on the boat to see his wife, and as he's there, about halfway through, the captain was aware of what happened to his family, and the captain told him that this was the spot as they were passing, that the boat crashed, and his four children died. And Horatio, at that moment, he said that comfort and hope filled his heart. And he wrote down these words with a pen and paper. And those are the words of the song. It is well. And they become this hymn that we sing. So Troy, would you do the honors? River attended my way. Oh, when sorrows like sea billows roll, Lord, whatever my lot, you have taught me to 
say it is well it is well with my soul so it is well it is well with my soul with my soul it is well lord it is well with my soul amen thank you troy hallelujah if it's well with your soul if you've been saved by god's grace no matter what your lot is whatever will befall you can have contentment i feel pressed to say this in my heart some of you guys there might be just one person here that's saying you know what i'm not content and if you were to go down to the root of why you're not content it's because you don't know jesus yet as your lord and your savior you haven't surrendered your life to him yet you might have known about god for a while but you've never had him fill the God-shaped hole in your heart. And that's what Jesus came to do. He came to die for you. And John 3, 16 says that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And if you believe in him, I promise, the Bible says all who believe in him will be saved. And if you, have, you need to make that decision to send, surrender to Christ right now, I wanna pray for you. Would you raise your hand if you, need to, if you know that's you and I need to fill that contentment with Christ. I need to accept him as my Lord and my Savior. Would you raise your hand if that's you? And I want to pray for you. Don't be afraid. Don't be shy. This is your day. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Anyone else? Or just raise your hand. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Sir, Jesus Christ died for you. He loves you. You are his sheep. And you confess him before men, he will confess you before his father. He will fill every gap that's been broken. Every pain will be healed by his wounds, and he loves you. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that you are the answer to everything we're looking for. You are the king. You are the one who satisfies our soul. So, Lord, we don't need more money. We don't need this circumstance to change. We need to trust in Jesus, and we need to pray, to praise, to trust your promise, and to change our perspective with the word of God. And so thank you, Lord, for teaching us contentment in all circumstances. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.